Hi, everyone. I'm Peyton. And I'm Eddie. And we're here to tell you how our next generation lab is powered by AWS cloud technology. I'm the co-founder and CSO of Big Cat Biosciences, a company that is building next generation antibodies to address um, critical unmet patient need. And I'm the VP of engineering at Big Hat, where we implement cloud native solutions to real scientific problems. And our talk is all about tech driven synthetic biology and how to build a cloud first modern wet lab. So we're going to start by telling you about Big Hat and our mission. Mission requires a different way of doing science and a different way of doing science means new technology needs and new demands on software and infrastructure. We'll explain how our particular needs at Big Hat are driven by three design loops that really shape our vision of applying technology to real world lab problems. And finally, we'll bring it all home by showing how AWS and cloud native software and infrastructure support our most important use cases. All right. So let me tell you about our people and our mission at Big Hat and why we wear funny hats. So Big Hat Biosciences mission is to improve human health by making it far easier to design advanced next generation antibody therapeutics. Um, antibodies are some of the most powerful and common therapeutic drugs that we have now to combat diseases like cancer. And automation and cutting edge lab equipment is essential along with um, good cloud practices uh, to enable the labs of the future. So in this lightning talk, what we're gonna do is talk through several case studies of Big Hat's tech forward lab powered by AWS and how that is driving faster development of much needed therapeutic antibodies. So um, in founding Big Hat, it was very clear that we needed a new kind of lab and to build that lab from the ground up um, to serve as a critical technical, um, technological nexus between lab automation, data science, machine learning, uh, as well as software. So how does technology play a role in this new vision of science for the future? So what does a next generation lab really mean? Um, historically, wet labs are very expert driven. You're sort of manually recording a lot of the data points from a lot of the experiments you run, kind of hand assessing, fitting curves, saying, do I see a difference in you know, condition A or condition B, et cetera. And that sort of means you go one person, one experiment at a time. Um, the modern context of a wet lab that Big Hat is trying to build um, is very rapid iteration, model driven, statistically assessed, um, and seamlessly engineered. And so what that allows us to do is to take the sort of single experiment, single person, very manual process, and scale it and automate it and make it seamlessly technologically driven. So we have adopted methods and processes that radically change the speed at which we can now move. Um, this means that we can pivot very quickly, we can inexpensively evaluate new assays, new experiments, new devices, new molecules. Um, and ultimately this mindset mindset um, shift means that we rely on technology and infrastructure in a fundamentally different and essential way uh, than a lot of the other companies and a lot of the way historic science has been historically done. Absolutely. So now we have just a, a bit of an idea of how different our software and infrastructure, infrastructure approach has to be in virtue of these differences in our scientific approach. We're going to get into the details. The new lab has three major design cycles that really drive our technology decisions. So the first loop um, is really about scientific design and the software and infrastructure, the software and general technical infrastructure that we need to implement that. So uh, ultimately what we need to do is allow design to be done in the lab by multiple people, as well as in an automated way to send those designs to the cloud and back um, and to kind of think about customers as everyone who's touching this type of design cycle, everyone that participates in designing an antibody, which is truly everybody from lab scientists, protein scientists, data scientists, program managers, program managers software engineers, um, hat wares across the board. So, you know, we have a lot of design tools, a lot of ways to sort of automatically assess quality, to automatically read out from different experiments, different assay types, and a lot of advanced visualizations that allow us to be able to democratize how design is done. And so you don't necessarily rely on someone with the uh, software engineering chops that you need in order to do that in a very seamless way. So it really is nimble, it's iterative, it's, it takes advantage of cloud native, and importantly, it's fit for Big Hat's purpose. And the next cycle to think about is how we can reliably, efficiently, and transparently close the gap between our lab experiments and the data they produce. It's difficult to do this precisely because of the need to move between the physical world where things are pretty messy and the digital world where the software is designed to do exactly what it does and the data captures exactly what happens. So how do you actually move forward in a world where things can break, where things fail, where uh, things get mislabeled, samples can get swapped? We need to have some kind of a data and software infrastructure that can track the immense 
that can accommodate the maximum flexibility for capturing and managing the data at the same time as provide trackable, trustworthy, reliable feedback about exactly the provenance of all the data and what happened to it during the process of processing. So in order to close the loop, we need automated workflows that are both automatic and still uh, allow for human feedback. They have to be flexibly implemented and cleanly reflect the results of our lab processes. We need a single place to manage our data. So and all aspects of it, where it was produced, how it was produced, from what data, from what experiment with what metadata, so that it's easily accessible to everyone at the company. As Peyton mentioned, everyone at the company is, has a vested interest, not only in what the results were, but the impact they have in their next designs, the next round. So we know that in order to make progress, we need these broad, comprehensive dashboards that will deliver validated insights into the quality of our antibodies. So it's automation, not just equipment automation, but also data capture automation, pipeline automation, QC automation, all of this leads to a situation where we can make that, make those tracking milestones, where we can actually onboard new experiments and instruments more quickly, where we can get automated pipelines and CICD so that the code, so that the data cycles, so that the pipelines are producing results as quickly, efficiently, reproducibly and reliably as possible. And the third loop is looping in machine learning uh, in each cycle. And this is perhaps the most exciting and involved loop and the one that ties ML uh, into every cycle of design of the data, um, generating the data back to the design, et cetera. And it really is what allows us to kind of unleash the power of our models on the um, problem of protein design. So typically one thinks about this design build test cycle as a loop, but in fact, what we have here is model um, coming in um, the loop, not just after the test, but actually every single time we design something, we build something or test something, the data from all those steps is being slurped up, being modeled after it's been QC'd and processed and using that information and those improved models to um, better our designs and as well as our processes, how we build and test them next time. So we call this all roads lead to the models. And that's really true in, in sort of the big cat design cycle. Um, ultimately, what looping in the machine, looping in machine learning every cycle allows us to do is to start from very small sequences, sometimes even one sequence, and to build um, a data set all entirely in-house, controlled by the processes Eddie was talking about previously, um, that allows us to get better um, trained models and therefore better design antibodies in very, very tight cycles and ultimately very small training set sizes. And so, you know, we really learn not just how to build a better antibody, but how to build a better process that build and test those antibodies. And that's really what this slide is all about, looping in machine learning every cycle to ultimately better our um, the molecules we make in-house. Awesome. So, you know, now we know a bit about Big Cat and our mission and how this new lab and the new science that we do in it um, has these new design cycles and how they design the technology that we need in order to satisfy. Them. So what we want to talk about now is, you know, now we know how those cycles kind of work and the very concrete scientific needs that we need to satisfy using our technology. What are the actual concrete use cases that we could, we could sort of articulate that really give a sense of exactly how AWS and cloud native technology in particular actually underpin these new capabilities that we need? Absolutely. So um, what we need is our DS uh, data science and um, AI ML or machine learning scientists to be able to work very easily and very naturally in the way that makes them most productive. But at the same time, the designs they create and the results that they get and the software they need um, needs to be kind of effortlessly and reliably and very quickly turned into production software so that it can be used um, and works in the cloud in the exact same way that it works locally for them. Um, and essentially, if we can't give these developers, you know, the freedom to use the most powerful tools that they want, um, and, uh, you know, we're limiting how fast they can move and, and how effective they can be. And so, um, really, we need to take the processes that they develop and turn them into automated production quality solutions. Uh, and if we can't do that successfully, we can't scale. So, um, Eddie, how do we do this? That's a good question. I'm certainly glad you asked. So we think of software development and the technology cycles that we have as being fundamentally driven by automation. This automation takes place in the code base itself with our CI CD processes that make sure that every change that we make is fully tested. This also actually ends up closing the loop to um, getting to production even faster than most companies can do. And so like the more automation you have in that process, the better, but also the automation that we have, um, you know, drives every piece of infrastructure declaration so that when we want to change an AI ML pipeline, we don't have to manually mess with resources all across the AWS infrastructure. Instead, 
we use declarative code as infrastructure through cloud formation and declarative uh, uh, declarations of, of uh, AWS resources in order to completely change the compute environment on the fly in minutes, not hours, not even, not days. And at places with local infrastructure, you, you need a new rack, you need a new kind of computing, you need a kind of processor, your, your GPU went out, it could be months before you're back in play. So this is like seconds to minutes and it's, and it's awesome. But another thing is, um, you know, I mentioned CICD already, but we'll go into like the security story a little bit. We talked a lot about data and data provenance, but what about the security aspects? Like we could spend hours, months, years thinking about the security. Like what was the, what's the consequence if, if one of our pieces of data that a partner piece of data gets out in the public or something. And so we want to have a comprehensive picture of security because not only does it optimize the extent to which we know that the data is secure and we are limited, you know, we don't have to do any kind of work to respond to incidents, but also a lot of time goes into our partner relationships, explaining why it is that their data is safe with us. And this is all obviated by just having a SOC 2 type two report, which is what this sort of single pane of glass security dashboard in AWS lets you get to with minimal effort. And then finally, you know, I think the, the big, story about uh, data and ML and automation that goes there is you have these event driven architectures that are provided by AWS through EventBridge, where you can say that any event in your infrastructure can automatically run pipelines can automatically run these sophisticated step functions you see in this in this picture on the middle right, uh, which sort of is a graph of work that can be arbitrarily created, saying here are QC steps here are map steps here are reduce steps. Here's how we can get calculations on every single one of our samples uh, given a particular um, data science pipeline. And this automation of infrastructure that can detach the need for humans to be running it manually and instead be driven by events that are taking place in our infrastructure, like somebody uploads a new event file, somebody uploads a new experiment result, somebody um, wants to trigger it using a, a, a piece of our app and just say like, want to rerun it and get new, new curves, then you just do that instantly. And the software as infrastructure approach means that all the changes to our AI ML pipelines, our data pipelines, and this event-driven infrastructure can be modified on the fly by anyone on the team with instant results. And that's pretty, that's pretty fantastic. That's pretty cool. So in addition to a seamless dev to prod environment, we also need everyone to easily access all of our data at any time and know exactly what that means. And we call that data democratization or data to the people. And what that means is we have all sorts of um, people with different backgrounds, as we mentioned, lab scientists, protein scientists, automation engineers, software engineers, data scientists, ML scientists. And all those team members are participating at all points in the cycle of design, build, test, and model. And so when we say data accessibility, it means that any of these groups or any of these people can come in and they can sort of learn what is the data, where did it come from, what has happened to it, how do I know? And you're constantly just generating new data sets, new assays, new designs, et cetera, especially on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really hard to keep track of all those. And so data democratization means we really need to track each of these pieces and, and not, not just technically and securely, but semantically understand what happened and what, what is this data set. So Eddie, how do we manage that at Big Hat? Well, so those processes I mentioned before for actually like sort of marshalling the data, you know, they have this underlying secure software uh, or data layer for storing everything. And then, you know, on top of that, the way to think about it is in the traditional uh, data analytics, data lake sense. How do we get the most information out of the data as it, as it queries up the stack? And how do we join across all the data and how we how do we visualize progress that we're making on like affinity calculations or affinity observations that we're making over time and compare like how our model quality is improving versus how our actual assessment of, of new antibodies is going and, and how we're finding antibodies that meet affinity targets even better than prior ones. And so on top of this underlying data layer is this big data lake that corresponds to like all the relational data we have, all of the DynamoDB data, all of the S3 data, all the data sets that we generate in all their different versions with all their different schemas. And we use Amazon Glue on top of that and Athena to query across all of those different data sources to provide a unified single SQL-like data layer that can talk about any of our data. So it means we marshal the data then it appears in any arbitrary calculation or aggregate accessible to this data lake query engine. And on top of that, 
all you need is a visualization tool, such as the one we use, which is Apache Superset, which gives you an almost unlimited set of different graphing and plotting utilities that can show beautiful, informative, and trackable dashboards that we can use to like measure the quality and improvement that we're seeing uh, round over round throughout all of our data. Exactly. And finally, what we need is to be able to track what's happening in the lab and also in our data processing pipelines. So we essentially need a work graph that lets us define and manage and track and report on how, how our SOPs or our protocols are generating data and how our processes are evaluating that data and, and ultimately need to turn that data into meaningful progress dashboards, which it says from the antibody or molecule we started, how are we doing right towards our ultimately our goals. And so, you know, what this really means in a high speed, high iterative wet lab is that we also need notifications as issues come up. You know, things um, that can be fully hands off are they run in the background, they run seamlessly, but then when a human, when a person, when a scientist needs to be notified and look at something, that also happens in a very seamless way. And so that allows humans to be in the loop when they need, while also letting a lot of the processes that are critical um, run as automated as possible. So Eddie, how do we support workflows both in the lab and, and um, in the cloud? That is a great and somewhat unexpected question. Yeah. <laughs> Our infrastructure, you know, as I mentioned, is it's seamlessly created in these serverless infrastructure items. This is to say that we, we try very hard to use pure events and infrastructure that is only there long enough to serve as the response to an event and then just goes away. And these very lightweight, very seamless, um, almost invisible infrastructures are kind of uh, I guess they're game changers in the, in the degree to which they mean you can respond nimbly to things because not only are they event driven, not only are they lightweight and, and therefore secure and unattackable because they only exist when they're actually being used, but also they can be changed, swapped, reordered, regraphed completely on the fly without any heavy lift because there's not like a big bank of servers to go update or a, a, a big bunch of software deployments to make across your entire infrastructure. Instead, you change the software definition in one place and everything runs differently instantly. And this is kind of, this is great. And it supports this idea of these workflows. So we, we can take these, you know, intuitively like process workflows that can cross the lab and the individual experiments and the individual acknowledgements and, and sign-offs and, and verifications and QC uh, review steps. And we can turn those into cloud step functions almost directly. And that way, Whenever we have a new thing that we want to in, sort of incorporate into this workflow idea, we simply make new steps, redeploy the infrastructure that then includes them, and, and we have this directly available to us in our back office. So we, we use these graphs um, directly in our back office, what we call Recce, which is our sort of like limbs-like lab plus AI plus data science plus science back office <laughs> tool. And, and this is where this code lives in this very light code base that relies so deeply on this underlying AWS infrastructure for storage, graphing, and actual work production that it's just, it underscores just how important the AWS integration that we have is for how we do this. And also how, how we do this is so driven by these crisp, modern, and, and just really like bleeding edge design principles that are only now accessible to us now that we have these big giant cloud providers. Exactly. And Recky is the brainchild of Eddie and the wizard hat. <laughs> so you can tell you more about that. Anyway, that's what we have for you today. We have three loops that support um, our next generation cloud lab as supported by AWS. You can see here our absolutely amazing team. Uh, we're always adding to it. So if you're interested, reach out to us. If you're watching this right now, you are internal, so. Put you on already, your hat. You already did. <laughs> you already did. Uh, and with that, um, we want to say thank you and um, feel free to reach out to either of us with questions. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>